Welcome. My name is Kevin Sturr, and I'm a professor of humanities at Boston University. And it's a great honor and pleasure on and on behalf of the Maine Irish Heritage Center to introduce Professor Kathy Fuller Seeley. Uh, Kathy is William P. Hobby Centennial Professor of Communication at the University of Texas at Austin's uh, Moody College of Communication. She has many publications, and her latest book is Jack Benny and the Golden Age of American Radio Comedy. She's the editor of Jack Benny's Lost Radio Broadcast. Kathy is also author of At the Picture Show, Small Town Audiences and the Creation of Movie Fan Culture. She's the co-author of Children and the Movies. She's edited the book, Hollywood in the Neighborhood, dealing with local movie, movie going. And she's also working on Francis Ford and Grace Kennard um, and their work throughout the silent era and beyond. I, try, I, I included as much as I could, but there's so much else to say, but welcome, Kathy. Thanks for being with us. Oh, Kevin, thank you so much. And I'm delighted to be here and to help contribute to this wonderful project. Well, it's great to have you. and. Uh, I, I guess I'd start just with um, the fact that Francis Ford is listed on the Internet Movie Database as having 496 acting credits. And I know a lot of those are, many of those are, are small uncredited roles, especially in the sound era, but that seems like it must approach some kind of a record um, in number of acting roles in, in movies. and. Uh, you know, going all the way back in many ways to the, you know, the, the middle part of the, uh, of the silent era. And even before that, where he got his start, but we'll be talking about that. He also has 180 directing credits listed. Um, he really was a pioneer in the silent era. And, uh, he's also has 31 writing credits for many of his stories and scripts, um, back in that time. So just an amazing figure. And I think we at the Maine Irish Heritage Center want to make sure that we give Francis Ford his full due because most of the focus tends to be on his younger brother, John Ford, um, certainly one of our greatest uh, filmmakers. John Ford influenced everyone from Ingmar Bergman to Federico Fellini to Akira Kurosawa and Scorsese and so forth. And yet it was his brother, Francis, we've learned, um, who had probably the greatest influence on John Ford in terms of his directorial style. So, well, we have plenty of questions for you, Kathy. Can you tell us a little bit about his youth, Kathy? And we know that at one point, of course, he went off um, on an adventure that took him to the filmmaking career, but how did it all work out? The Feeney O'Farina Ford clan were all um, marvelous storytellers. And uh, it's been a challenge to try and uh, dig behind the stories that they love to tell, uh, tall stories about uh, each other's beginnings and their uh, adventures and efforts. And uh, my story on Francis Feeney Ford is still ongoing. I don't know everything yet, but, uh, and perhaps I'll never know everything. That's how these fellows are. But it's been fascinating to learn uh, given all the research that John Ford scholars have done about John Ford's background to find that Francis Ford's was actually fairly similar. Um, Francis Feeney, Francis Joseph Feeney, uh, much like John Ford, uh, he had regular schooling up through 10th grade. Uh, he, uh, as much as they, uh, as he grew up in, in the town, in the working class section, uh, in a, a, a small apartment, sort of near to his father's uh, restaurant and, and bar and pub, uh, he was also very active uh, in the, the community, the countryside. He uh, Francis tells stories of riding, fishing, swimming, doing all the things a young man uh, uh, might be able to do in that land of, uh, of beautiful outdoor uh, entertainments. He also was quite a reader. He loved Sherlock Holmes stories and mystery stories. Um, 
all, uh, although uh, uh, Joseph McBride's been able to uh, point out that uh, uh, Jack Feeney or John Ford was often a um, often attended the local theater in Portland and was an usher and things like that. It's possible that uh, uh, Frank, as he was known among his family, uh, also did those things, but I don't quite have the evidence yet. So nevertheless, he was a an educated young man who had a um, a mischievous streak, who loved to run away from home, who was felt um, a little stultified by the pressures of having to listen to authority and behave. One of the most interesting things that happened uh, and uh, something that shaped his uh, the rest of his life and his character was he volunteered for the Spanish-American War uh, in the uh, spring of uh, 1898 when the war was declared. He and about a thousand other young men from Maine uh, volunteered for the war and they were taken down by train to uh, ch near Chattanooga, Tennessee uh, and uh, uh, trained. Uh, there were as many as 60,000 troops in this encampment in Chickamauga, Georgia. Francis actually started as a bugler, a musician. So he's not just a regular private, but also a musician. Uh, uh, and back in the day before electronic communication, when buglers uh, were very important to send uh, commands or troop movements or, you know, start the day and end the day. Um, unfortunately, as much as he apparently loved his military service and they were all so anxious to get to uh, get on a, a train in a boat and go down to Cuba and, and fight up San Juan Hill and become all, all brave soldiers. Unfortunately, dysentery and other diseases soon swept the camp. Um, and by October, uh, many thousands of the soldiers were quite ill and several hundred died. Francis uh, Feeney was one of the ones who caught dysentery and he was quite ill. It's I don't know at this point whether he tells a story of his father having to come uh, down to Georgia and take him home or whether he actually came back on the train with the thousand other well and invalided soldiers. But that was his short experience in the Spanish-American War, but set up a love of military tales and an interest in, in military doings, I think that uh, 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 Francis, I think, would pass down to John. Soon after that, uh, he became a tailor. He apprenticed as a tailor and became uh, uh, quite adept at the fine work of sewing suits and coats and men's haberdashery. This is another thing that would stay with Francis his whole life. Um, all photos that you see of, of Francis Ford uh, off, off screen uh, is an impeccably tailored man who wears clothes marvelously. And it's very funny that uh, Jack Ford or John Ford was so careless oftentimes about uh, how he looked, whether this was to be different from his brother. I don't know. His first child, Philip, was born uh, at the end of 1900. Um, at that point, uh, Feeney family lore says that uh, Francis ran away again to the circus. But I'm finding through Ancestry.com and other sources that most likely he and his young wife and child uh, decamped to Bridgeport, Connecticut, where he worked as a tailor. Until about uh, late 1906, in which time Della had a second child named Arthur after her father, and the poor baby passed away at about two months. What I know is that Francis Ford's first marriage broke up at this point. Della took the infant Philip, came back to Portland, but at that point, that's when um, Francis Feeney decided to try his luck in the theatrical profession. He goes down to New York and is doing everything from sweeping the streets and, and tending bar to doing anything but because he has these uh, marvelous uh, formal clothes, he has a tuxedo and suits and other things he had sewn as a tailor, he is able to get a job in the theater, at least um, doing one night stands with a known um, uh, Broadway actress named Amelia Bingham. So uh, he finds his way into the theatrical business through, uh, uh, through his clothes. Uh, but uh, at this point, he meets another woman um, named Elsie Van Name, a young actress, and uh, they end up getting married and she's expecting. And at that point, he says, I need to stick around New York. Her family was on Staten Island. And so he decided as a way of staying in New York to uh, try out the new moving picture business. 
So by 1908 and 1909, um, uh, uh, Francis Feeney was one of the pioneers of the picture business. By that time, he'd also changed his name to Francis Ford. I tend to think has the most credibility as that he actually saw a new Model T Ford uh, going down the street. It was the same uh, period of time, the fall of 1908, in which Henry Ford debuted the Model T and was one of the few times the Henry Ford plastered advertising all over New York City. And that Francis Feeney's handwriting, he loved the curly QFs. And I think he was really taken with the Ford logo, which is also a curly cute F. And no matter what, uh, thus Francis Feeney became Francis Ford and became a pioneering actor in the motion picture business. Ford was there um, uh, with, uh, he didn't work at Biograph, but he worked everywhere else. While uh, getting, breaking into the business, he was a day actor. And he tells in his, his unpublished autobiography, the story of having to, you showed up at a studio early in the morning, but the studios were scattered all over New York and New Manhattan and New Jersey, Long Island and, and the Bronx. And so you, uh, if you went to one, you might not be able to make it to the others. He appeared in a, uh, a uh, Thomas Edison filled a Western called Pardoners, which was a pretty elaborate one wheel. He caught on with um, David Horsley and the Nestor Company in uh, uh, New Jersey, uh, uh, making some films uh, uh, from the early independence in the summer of 1909. But then he caught on with Gaston Melies in the summer and, and the fall of 1909. Gaston was the uh, elder brother of a famous magician filmmaker, Georges Melies. Georges um, had been making all those magic films, the brief things, marvelous uh, 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 ways of using early film special effects to uh, make m fabulous magic tricks. Um, but George's career was kind of, uh, was very much slowing down the, um, uh, the fad for the 60 second or 90 minute, uh, 90 second magic films was falling and the trend was becoming one real melodramas and comedies. So Gaston having the right to distribute at least one reel of film a week with the Melies name, got permission from Thomas Edison to join the trust of the Biograph Company, the Vitagraph Company, the Calum Company, and the other studios. So Gaston Melies now had the ability to make a one reel film, uh, but he needed a cast and a crew. So he advertised for such, and he took Francis Ford. They made some films uh, in the Bronx in the fall of 1909, and they did mediocrely, but Gaston decided that what the market needed was one real Westerns. So Gaston Melies in January 1910 decides to send a company of actors and crew to the furthest West he could afford to send them, and that was San Antonio, Texas. So of, of, of that made, and no one, maybe only one company had gone to California by that point for the winter because it was dreadful shooting films in the winter in New York. It was gray like you have there in Maine. It snowed, it was cold, um, and all films mostly needed to be shot outside at the time. Many companies were going to Jacksonville, Florida, but Gaston decided to be different and go to San Antonio, Texas. Francis Ford was there for four months, shooting some of the first authentic uh, Westerns uh, made there. They were of mediocre some quality. Some were quite interesting, but Gaston ran out of money, brought the company back to New York that summer. That's when a, a wonderful thing happened. He was able to get the, the services of young actress Edith Story, who went on to become a big, big star of uh, at Vitagraph and eventually Metro of the mid-teens. Uh, but Edith joins because uh, she loves, she's a tomboy and she loves to ride horses and she'd love to make Westerns. They go back out to San Antonio in late October, 1910, and they proceed to make a series of about 80 more one real Western films that are fascinating. We have about five of them. They're delightful comedies and melodramas um, set in the modern day sort of ranch West. 
there were a few uh, cowboy and Indian kind of films, but they start to get tremendous notice uh, from the critics and audiences. Gaston is suddenly selling many copies of the film and uh, Francis Ford and Edith Story are gaining great notice. One real spectacular film about the fall of the Alamo in May uh, 1911, Gaston decides that California is the place he wants to be. This thrilled Francis Ford, who had long desired to go to California, and that's where all the cool kids were going in the uh, summer and fall of 1911. So Gaston gets out there, and uh, uh, he and Francis and a number of other people are making westerns as fast as they can. In fact, Gaston got so far ahead of his release schedule that he laid everybody off, just plain fired everybody in November 1911. That's when Ford was able to join Vin, uh, Ince. In fact, he'd been hired by the Western director of the Bison Company to be their director. Little did Fred Balshafer know that Kessel and Bauman back in the East, back in New York, had hired Tom Ince. So Thomas Ince comes out to California and uh, says, I'm the director here, but gee, I feel bad for you, Francis, so I'll make you my lead actor. The miracle that occurred, and I don't want to go on about this too long, but it's fascinating history that nobody's written about. What Ince is able to do is hire an entire Wild West rodeo company, the 101 Bison Ranch, who went around as large as the biggest circus, as big as Barnum and Bailey and Ringling Brothers Circus. The 101 Bison Ranch toured the country in the summer months with a thousand cast members, 500 Indians, 500 cowboys and cavalry putting on wild west shows of Indian attacks and cavalry charging and cowboys roping and all this. Well, Ince is able to hire them for their winter break since they were in Los Angeles anyway. And this makes the Ince movies of the first half of 20 of 1912 the most spectacular action fin films anyone had ever seen. And here's Francis Ford being assistant director playing lead cavalryman, sometimes lead Indian. And you can see in these Ince films of 1912, some things that show up eventually in John Ford films, figures standing silhouetted in open doorways, uh, a, a cavalry and Indians riding sinuous trails over mountains and hills into valleys, not just sort of racing across the screen, but an incredible attention to the landscape and details. Um, a uh, marvelous, um, what do I want to say, um, subtle acting, not tearing up the scenery with wrenching, you know, pulling your hair and doing things like that, and using the uh, incredible skills of the 101 uh, uh, cavalry and Indians. Of uh, They would do uh, the, the death march, the death circle, the circle of death, the Indians call it, where uh, they would, on their, hundreds of them on their riders, would circle the either um, the settlers encamped, you know, circling their wagons or the cavalry or, or other kind of cowboys and shoot them all down dead. And this got used in a number of Ince films that spring, as I said, that were fabulously famous. And here is um, Francis Ford in the absolute middle of these things. Well, Thomas Ince didn't like to give credit to anybody other than Thomas Ince. This is what, but he did give Francis the right to become his own director. And in the second half of 1912, Francis is making one and two real films using part of the Indians and part of the cast, um, while uh, Ince is uh, uh, having other directors make three and four real spectaculars. But so this is where Francis Ford really gets his hands-on experience. And uh, by November 1912, he ends up in a little bit of a fist fight with Thomas Ince, because Ince tells the world that Ince has uh, um, directed all these films and that, uh, you know, everybody else is just chicken feed. And Francis Ford knows what he's contributed. Lumley was, uh, Lumley's company was uh, um, releasing as many as six to 10 reels a week. So he needed many companies and he was very happy to bring in Francis Ford and gave him his own company. Here's your cameraman. Here's your cameras. Here's budget was, you know, I mean, there, there, there weren't pinch pennies. Uh, what Francis Ford also was able to bring to Universal is Grace Cunard. 
a marvelous young actress who was only 18, who he'd met halfway through the, she'd come West and joined the Inns Company. Um, she was a fabulous melodramatic screenwriter and they became best friends and eventually partners, pretty soon partners, because Elsie uh, Ford's wife had gone back East. She hadn't liked it in California. So here's Francis Ford all alone and marvelous Grace Cunard. And they become a, one of Universal's premier acting, directing uh, couples, along with Lois Weber and Philip Smalley, who are big news today for talking about the women directors of Hollywood. But Francis Ford is such, I want to say a feminist, a proto-feminist. He has no problem having Grace star in these films. She's usually either a jewel thief or a spy. Half the time, he's the villain. He's a rival jewel thief. He's the bad guy she's got to kill. He's a crazy old guy. He loves playing character parts. They co-direct the films. He's lead director. She sometimes helps direct. She writes all their scenarios. And they, they are um, um, a filmmaking machine. They're turning out at least a real week, if not a two and three real film, nearly every week. I think IMDb has seriously undercounted all the films that he appeared in and directed. Yes, they're short, but if you just the quantity of film completed each week, they got asked by, and I won't go on too long, but they got asked in the spring of 1914 by Carl Lemley to try something new. This would be a cliffhanger serial. It turns out that you all, audiences know the perils of Pauline, if they've ever heard of a cliffhanger serial, but that became kind of the Netflix binging of spring of 1914. Edison made a serial. Uh, Thanhauser Company made a serial. Pathé uh, made uh, The Perils of Pauline. And Universal made a serial made by Francis Ford and Grace Cunard called Lucille Love, Girl of Mystery. Uh, it was a spectacular thing. Uh, um, uh, she's a, a girl. Uh, um, uh, he plays the villain. She plays the girl. The villain is very jealous of her father in the Philippines, who's an admiral, and he steals some evidence and he's out to ruin the admiral's career. She chases him all across the Pacific and they're in Japan. They're in China. They're on Samoa. They meet elephants. They meet camels. Don't ask how camels got to Asia. They meet Aborigines. They meet headhunters. They, you know, they're on planes, trains, boats, automobiles, chasing each over. They get to the Americas. They're chasing each other from San Francisco to Mexico. Um, and the audiences loved it. Um, all of them became rich through this serial because previously films have been sold. You made money by selling one reel of film uh, one print of one reel of film and maybe 20 or 30 prints was all it took to get across America. You know, everybody just showed the one reel and passed it along to the next theater. Well, the difference about a cliffhanger serial is that everybody wanted to show it at the same time. And then everybody wanted the next reel. There were 15 reels to these serials. Francis Ford and Grace Cunard as director and screenwriter, as well as actors, they made a million dollars each. And oh boy, Carl Lemley made millions of dollars too. But let's just say, in night, so when this film was fit, the series was finished in the spring of night, summer of 1914, Francis Ford decides to go back to Maine, a conquering hero. Now everybody in Portland who had, you know, not known the little Taylor and his wife and baby who had left now knew here was this famous guy. So I've just recently learned that Francis Ford came back to Portland in um, July and August of 1914. And they had him as a guest at all the theaters and they were playing Lucille Love. And so no wonder young Jack Feeney said, you know, oh my goodness, I've just graduated from high school. Can I come out maybe before I go off to college or maybe I'll try college and then come out anyway. So this is how young Jack Feeney um, makes a connection again with a brother who was 12 years older than he was. Jack probably didn't know Francis at all when Francis had left to begin with, but now he's this big thing called a movie star. The Feeney family lore is that, uh, uh, you know, that, that Francis had run off to join the circus and never come back. Uh, uh, about that time, 
uh, uh, there's a uh, John Ford tells the story, or and as well as Francis Ford loves to tell the story that there was somebody matching Frank's description who was who had uh, become a, um, a a thief, a, a, a bank robber out in about Je Yellowstone, out in the far west, and uh, their mother was terribly afraid that this is what had happened to her son. He'd become a bank robber. Mm. I found in the Bangor newspaper that is uh, while he was still with uh uh ints that uh in late 2012 early no yes by early 1913 that movie theater managers in bangor knew that somebody they had known from portland named frank feeney was now in the movies um and so uh, john ford likes to tell jack feeney likes to tell the story that when he was ushering at a at a theater Oh, he sees somebody on the screen uh, who may indeed have been his brother. And oftentimes they use the actors, some, some uh, takeoff on the actor's name for the characters because they were making so many films. So maybe he had seen an, uh, a character named Bob Ford and looked and maybe it looked like his brother. So there are marvelous stories about uh, the family uh, that uh, Jack Feeney then running home to his mother and going, I've seen brother Francis. I've seen brother Frank. And maybe the rest, of the, more of the brothers and sisters piling down to the Nickel Theater to see if it's it was true. Um, but as you see, there is a, a growing evidence, even in newspapers, that uh, uh, local Maine folks were finding out that one of their own was becoming a, a, a sort of well-known uh, uh, early actor and director in the movies. So, uh, uh, do you think, Kathy, that um, when John Ford met um, his brother again, along mm -hmm. with Grace Kennard, when they came back to Portland mm -hmm. in J July of 1914, mm -hmm. that he was pretty convinced he'd like to follow his brother's adventures in the movie making field. Um, it was probably, I think you've suggested around August or September yes. of 1914, when John Ford would have at least made a short trip out to, yeah. to Los Angeles. Can you tell us a little bit about John Ford's involvement and his, I think he was called Jack Ford then, yes. about, about his involvement in his brother's movie making around that time. It's a marvelous story that we still don't know all of, but I keep finding more and more um, uh, pic photos, stills, uh, uh, both screen grabs, things behind the scene that show Jack Ford busy at work uh, uh, with Francis and Grace. Um, I believe he did come back about, uh, Francis Ford took, a, you didn't film in the summer in California. There was something called June gloom that uh, lots of clouds obscured the sun. So that's when uh, filmmaking quieted down, but it would pick up again in September. And uh, uh, Francis Ford and Grace Cunard were getting ready to embark on yet another serial. It was going to be called The Broken Coin. And um, indeed, uh, Jack Ford, uh, uh, finds himself out there and Francis Ford gives him a thorough uh, introduction to the movie business. He starts out everything from hauling scenery and being a prop assistant to all of a sudden by at least by December 1914, he's appearing in films. Um, uh, I have a picture, uh, um, a drawing of a movie poster that has uh, uh, Jack Ford in it. I have stills from Grace Cunard's collection from the serial the uh, broken coin that has Jack Ford in a regular part. I think it's very amusing that in later years, Jack Ford will refuse to admit to Peter Bogdanovich or to Joseph McBride that indeed he'd been an actor. Um, a few times uh, you, uh, uh, you see him, he doesn't look very confident, but nevertheless, he got better at it. So he's involved in everything. The, the stories come down that uh, uh, in, uh, there's one story that, that John Ford loved to tell that maybe Francis Ford had made him hold uh, and uh, it made him do some dangerous stunts, like uh, uh, hold on to small sticks of dynamite when they exploded or, or you know, be uh, in the way of Civil War cannon going off. I don't doubt that those things were true. But uh, just as Grace Cunard ended up in the hospital many times. She fell off elephants. She, uh, they, it was a very rough and tumble life, and everybody was going to get hurt uh, uh, back in the day. 
uh, of, of making movies. It was a strenuous business. So as I said, I'm, I don't quite have the complete answers yet about the sort of give and take uh, 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 between sort of mean spiritedness. I, I think Francis Ford was a very loyal in this company. Grace Cunard brought out her sister and her mother from Columbus, Ohio. And Mina Cunard, her sister, not only worked as a stand-in, but also an actress. Very soon, Francis Ford brought his young son, Philip, out. And um, eventually, they would bring their brother, Eddie, out. And then Josie, all the members of the family came out. And I have some films. I have a film from about 1922 after Francis and Jack had kind of parted ways and Jack was a full-time director. I found a, a film that Francis Ford made with Texas Guinan. We know her as a, a nightclub uh, owner in the late 1920s, but she was um, be a, very much a, 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 a Texas uh, tomboy town, uh, tom girl. And uh, she was going to be featured in a series of Westerns about a very active gun shooting, cowboy, horse riding uh, Western heroine. Francis directed one of those films and it has his sister Josie, his niece Cecile, <laughs> all these members of the family. He really did. And um, I, I included a picture we can look at at some point later. When Jack, uh, Francis came back to Portland again in the summer of 1915, bringing Jack, and uh, he also brought a movie camera. And Francis Ford actually shot two films on location in Portland that involved the entire Feeney clan. One is called Chicken Hearted Jim, and luckily we have everybody, including his, all his brothers, his sisters, niece and nephews, you know, father. It's, it's very amusing. And of course, Francis Ford plays the cowardly um, anti-hero in a full dress suit, one of the tuxedos he had made himself. We have, uh, it's, it's very much a family operation and certainly um, Jack Ford would continue this. As much as you say, uh, Kevin, that uh, IMDB says that uh, Francis Ford's last credits is about in 1928. It's actually true that um, John Ford would use both Eddie and Francis as uh, 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 mostly uncredited assistant directors for the best part of 30 years. So we don't know quite, we don't have all the records yet of all the ways they worked together, but they did. You have a nice photo of, um, of uh, Francis and John Ford together around the year 1935, along with their brother, Eddie, and uh, Francis's son, Phil, uh, when they were working together. What, what can you find on YouTube and the internet to, to look back at some of these sure. early signs? Well, well they are indeed hidden in the far corners, but it's amazing what's becoming available. I, uh, these beautiful restorations of John Ford's early Westerns with Harry Carey just bowl me over for their gorgeousness. Um, we have four of the, um, uh, four or five, four are in good shape, of the Melies films uh, that Francis shot in, uh, uh, was appeared in in San Antonio and where he learned how to be an assistant director. Very few of the Universal films unfortunately exist, but uh, by a miracle, two, uh, half of each, half of two of his uh, serials with Grace Cunard uh, have been put out on the Women Filmmakers, Pioneering Women Filmmakers C, uh, CD set. And those were actually found in a Dawson City, Yukon, up as far into the, you know, uh, the gold mining Yukon that you could find. They had been shown in a movie theater and it was not worth anybody's money to send them back to the distributor. So the movie theater manager, uh, the Nickelodeon manager in Dawson City simply threw them out the back window into a, a, a hole and covered them over with ice and, uh, and rocks. <laughs> and they were later discovered. I was up uh, many years ago to the silent film festival in, um, in Bucksport, Maine, uh, which was which was held by the Northeast Historic Film and, and, and someone involved in that discovery had come down to show some of this uh, footage. Francis Ford was especially interested in making mysteries. Um, and and I, somewhere it said that Francis Ford had commented that uh, he believes mystery appeals to all, you know, film goers and that, you know, um, all mysteries have to have suspense that has to have what he called the mystery element. And uh, 
Just from having viewed some of these, Kathy, what, what can you tell us about Francis Ford and his mysteries? He loved Sherlock Holmes. He, uh, he didn't like sort of simple love stories. He loved uh, his, his uh, female characters are as wily, as active, and sometimes as evil as the men. Um, he also had a great sense of humor, and he really loved to uh, combine elements of humor and surprise and mystery, whether there are, are masked characters, whether there's uh, 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 bad, mysterious bad guys. There's usually, um, uh, or at least in the Grace Cunard films, a, an inquisitive, a uh, very bright and athletic young woman who wants to find out the, the end of the mystery, to, to solve the clues to uh, uh, bring things about. And uh, he does that whether he's making technically a, a, a Western, a modern day film, uh, a, a, a comedy, a serial. Uh, so, so that's, he liked to make an, an action films. He was known for things that, for uh, actors that he called Ford fighters. And uh, he would hire these little, these short young men uh, uh, who are oftentimes only five foot or five foot two. And he would teach them, train them to do a whole lot of arm flailing. And um, so if uh, you can see that in John Ford's Bucking Broadway, the Harry Carey film that's maybe his second or third film when the cowboys end up in what's supposed to be New York City, but you know it's Los Angeles, and they want to save the heroine from the city slickers. You know, all the cowboys turn into Ford fighters. So lots of flailing of arms. Um, they uh, Francis Ford had a fella um, named Eddie Polo who had been a circus strongman. And so he'd have one character who could fling the Ford fighters at will. <laughs> so um, as I said, the Ford loved these kind of things. He also loved trap doors uh, and, and uh, uh, pits with alligators in them. And I'd also sort of like to, I'd like to mention that what, why Francis and Grace, they disappear. For the, Grace disappears from the screen at the end of the, um, of the Purple Mask. And it's because, as I said, filmmaking was very, very hard work in the day. She'd been injured quite often and she was tremendously traumatized. Several of the actors in the serial died horrific deaths in accidents in front of her. What finally did it in was a race car driver who had been their own chauffeur and they were encouraging his uh, uh, career as a race car driver. Back in the day when there weren't seat belts or roll cages or things like that, uh, they were shooting an episode of The Purple Mask that involved a race car driver. And he had a spectacular crash and killed like six or seven people while he, you know, expired. And Grace just couldn't take any more of it. Um, and so she had a series of nervous breakdowns and ended up re basically retiring from the screen. That's when John Ford just said, uh, I'm going to go and be my own director. What Francis Ford wanted to be, on the other hand, was independent. He did not like the growing number of bean counters at Universal. And he had a big pot of money. So he decided to build his very own studio the Francis Ford Ford Art Studio, one wall of which still exists on the 6,000 block of Sunset Boulevard near Gower. Um, uh, so it's still there and that's kind of cool. So Francis Ford, much like what the film historians are saying about the generation of women filmmakers who uh, get, get pink slipped, Francis Ford too. He put all his money into making films and what he didn't know and could not have anticipated was that the new Hollywood studios would um, carve up distribution. They would get entire control of film distribution and he could put all his, he could make all the films he wanted, but he couldn't get them out to movie theaters. That's what intrigues me is that while John Ford's star took off, you know, as a director yeah. and he, and he um, learned the craft and then eventually by, you know, 1939 was making these yeah. masterpieces like The Grapes of Wrath and Stagecoach and so forth. Francis Ford, uh, you could say, um, uh, was not the star that John Ford uh, became right. in, in the directorial world. And um, I'm just wondering about that transition because John Ford later in his career credited D.W. Griffith and his brother Francis Ford with being his two greatest influences. I think John Ford said something like, there's nothing they're doing in motion pictures nowadays that my brother Francis didn't yeah. do, you know, way back when. But uh, 
At the same time, you know, Francis Ford is starring in almost 500 or more films until 1953 when he died. And many of these are small, uncredited roles, even mm -hmm. not just in his brother John's films, but in films like Frankenstein in 1931 yeah. and the Oxbow incident and they died with their boots on. Um, oh, he's in so many things. So Yeah, it's just amazing, amazing films. And then if you read, you know, the list of all of his brother's major films, he's in them. What happened? Uh, did there, I, I remember reading somewhere that John Ford or someone had said that Francis Ford had many great, brilliant ideas, but he wasn't great when it came to discipline. Is that is that the problem or what did you find in your research? Um, and yet discipline. Well, um, I, I think it's important to remember how many years he'd been in the business. 1909. Even in 1929 would be 20 years. And he was 28 years old when he started. So he wasn't an 18 year old or 17 year old like Jack Ford was. So he was, you know, I mean, so he was getting on in age. Um, I think Francis Ford had a bit of melancholia about him. He felt that, that the industry had kind of passed him by. He uh, loved Irving. He had greatly admired Irving Thalberg who had become that bright young man, you know, taking over at Universal, the Western manager uh, for Carl Lumley in the early 1920s. But Francis Ford just could not stand the having to shoot someone else's scripts. He wasn't willing to do what John Ford was willing to do in his young days. Um, he, he wanted to be his own boss. He wanted to be independent. Um, and he actually managed to do that in the latter half of the 1920s in his autobiography, he tells the story that he basically formed a film co-op with six friends and they decided to make the cheap Saturday morning stuff. But he didn't care. He was out making movies. And the seven of them would have a budget of $6,000 to produce 30 reels of film or, if you will, a 15 chapter serial for one of the Poverty Row um, studios. Uh, as I said, to release to small town theaters on a Saturday morning. Well, they'd take that $6,000, they'd go shooting out on public streets, they'd stop trains, they'd do all these crazy things. They would be able, when they completed the film on budget, they sold it for $60,000. There's a lot of money in the mid-1920s. And then the seven of them would split the money equally. And he says that was good enough. So he just decided that kind of his day had passed, that he was, Francis decided he wasn't willing to make the compromises and shoot other people's films. So that's the choice he made. I'm still chasing down information about the fact he may have also suffered a, suffered a severe injury while working on a Fox film in the late 1920s that he says he tried to claim, um, uh, he's tried to sue the Fox studio saying that you've ruined my directorial career. All I can do from here on out is play bit parts. But nevertheless, if you see him in Steamboat Round the Bend, where France, where Jack Ford used him drunk and, you know, I mean, so he did a few um, uh, very physical parts for some J Jack Ford films. He also worked every single week while, um, when sound came in, uh, he was not only working in many, many uncredited bit parts, but they, there's also all the work he did that I haven't found the evidence for yet um, at working on John Ford Cruise. But he worked hard and all the time because he still had to make his living. He had, by that time, a third wife. He was still raising his uh, last two children, um, also who got bit parts in or, or parts on set in John Ford movies. Uh, they still kept the family together. Um, so, but he seemed sort of at content. He seemed kind of at peace, if melancholy about it, that Hollywood had kind of become a huge industry and it passed him by. Um, and yet his, his marvelous tiny parts uh, in John Ford films that are always the sort of crazy eyed drunken man uh, who um, maybe it's Tag Gallagher. One of the authors calls him Brother Feeney a recurring character in John Ford films. And I love to watch out for them. But he, as I said, he was kind of um, content to be a kind of a, a one of the pioneers. He hung out. He was very loyal to all his friends from the early years of the industry. 
Um, so he lived a kind of quiet life, and that's the choice he made. So, now, obviously, John Ford wanted to keep his brother working, and uh, yeah. he put he put him in bit parts in many of his films. Sometimes he has a very crucial role. Oftentimes, he doesn't speak very much, if at all. And uh, some people have theorized that uh, from the many John Ford films in which Francis Ford plays some someone close to being a fool or the mm -hmm. jester in the film, um, that it was a kind of revenge um, by John Ford against having been treated uh, poorly by his brother. But you, you've cast doubt on that. And uh, I wonder whether Francis Ford liked to do these little um, quiet but hilarious roles in the films. Maybe, that, maybe it was due to his own choice, do you think? Well, it was also the work he could get. But, you know, there was this community of the old actors. Um, Cecil B. DeMille looked after a number, a bunch of them, you know, so a number of actors would, would hire the old timers enough to give them money to, you know, afford a tiny apartment and, you know, and, and you know, bread on the table and things like that. Francis Ford also played that kind of role, the crazy eyed, uh, either Southern vet, a Civil War veteran and either a Yankee or a or a Confederate cap in four, in films that are not John Ford films. Um, but I can say in his own films between 1910, you know, in the 1920s, John, uh, Francis Ford was not one of these who had to play the hero. Uh, whereas a number of other, let's say Douglas Fairbanks always had to play the hero. Uh, J, Jack Kerrigan always had to play the hero. Um, he was just as happy playing uh, character roles. And there are a number of crazy-eyed films, uh, crazy-eyed characters in the films he put himself into. So it became something he was kind of known for. And what I love looking for in those films, something that has been said he would say uh, when he was another director perhaps uh, 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 worked with him and would give him a page of dialogue. And Francis would say, but I could do it so much better if I didn't have to talk. I love the fact that when you find him in these bit character parts, so many times he's just using his face and his hands and his movement. Yes, I wanted to ask you about that, Kathy, because sometimes the characters he plays, even in these bit parts with very few words, they seem so similar and not always just in John Ford yes. films. It almost seemed like Francis Ford had it in mind to develop a kind of a persona um, almost like a, you know, a silent comedian like Chaplin or Keaton, but to do it even in the sound era. So he, I would, yeah. no, please I, go I, ahead. I, I certainly don't disagree with you. You know, he found it, it was his way to make a mark. It was a way that when uh, casting directors are looking for a crazy person, well, you could get Charlie Grapewine or you can might as well go for Francis Ford. So um, he also bought the time he married for the third time in 1934-35. He'd also grown his beard permanently, his sort of shaggy, that's the way you see him in so many films. And uh, he, his wife wanted him to shave for their wedding. And he said, no, this is how I earn my money. So, he, you know, he definitely knew that those roles were his sort of bread and butter. How long did he remain with Grace Kennard as as partners in life? Um, oh, oh no. Well, well, um, his he met her uh, in the summer of 1912 on the Inslot, but his then wife Elsie, who's the mother of his two younger children, she was quite unhappy. She didn't like being in Los Angeles. Maybe he had to travel far. She was very unhappy. And so she took the boys back to, she, she only had one son at that point, Robert. And she took him back to New York by 1913. Francis writes in his unpublished autobiography that he felt very lonely and that he really admired Grace as a creative partner. He's very old fashioned and kind and doesn't say things. Well, Henry Hathaway's mother, Jean Hathaway, became a very close friend uh, and, uh, 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 with Francis and Grace and was a member of their company acting in hundreds of films. She played an older female part or an aunt or something like that. And they were in, she was, pre, uh, they were also socialized together tremendously. And Henry Hathaway remembers when he was interviewed uh, uh, for a, a, an autobiography. And uh, Henry Hathaway remembers he was a young boy of like 11 uh, at this point in December, 1916, when Grace just up runs away 
uh, catches the first man she can get a hold of and, and elopes with him to Seal Beach, California. Henry Hathaway remembers that Francis was devastated. He remembers that her mother, that his mother, Jean, and he, the young son, found him somewhere, that he'd just gotten himself stinking drunk. He'd rolled in the mud. He was sad, just crying about grace, 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 grace has left me. And so they take him back to the Hathaway home, apartment home, and clean him up. And, and Henry Hathaway remembers, we sat him down to eat dinner with us, and he was so sad and upset. And then Jean Hathaway, the mother, says, well, we better say grace you know, grace over the meal. And Francis goes, grace. <laughs> so so I, don't have, I, I don't have any reason to doubt that story. But by February, about two months later, the story is that young Robert back in New York told his mother when she, when he would go to the movies that he would cry saying, I miss my daddy. I want to be back with my daddy. And so Francis agreed to remarry Elsie, and they came back out west in 2017. The grandson tells me she was getting crippling rheumatoid arthritis by that point, so she couldn't become the leading lady. Uh, she she technically writes some scripts for his uh, serials, uh, but they have another son together, uh, Billy or William, uh, who is the father of the two four grandchildren who are, are, are alive today. So um, that, so sadly, um, Grace did not stay long with that young married man she married in a hurry, was the youngest brother of the acting Moors, uh, one who had been the first husband of Mary Pickford, one who had married Alice Joyce. He was unfortunately, Joe Moore, her husband, who was like 19, he was drafted in World War I and couldn't get out of it and had to go. And by the time he came back, they were divorced. She eventually, she got herself jobs because she also was a really expert seamstress and had sewn her own costumes. She gets jobs uh, in the 30s and 40s working in the costume departments at the major studios. She eventually marries a fella named Jack Shannon, who it was a stunt cowboy. And they were happily married for over 40 years. From what I can tell, Jack, uh, uh, Grace and Francis made up. They weren't best friends, but I found them making appearances together and that they that let bygones be bygones and helped remember the old days. Just in conclusion, I, w I wanted to see if you would uh, tell us just a little bit more again about your project and trying to restore four of the old Francis Ford films and how we might wind up seeing that. We're about halfway done and it's very exciting to give Francis Ford his due. He's truly, I think, one of the last greatest figures of that pre-1920 silent era that uh, hasn't been um, explored fully. And neither have, the other thing we still have to explore are the serials in much more detail. There's been a couple books about uh, 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 Perils of Pauline, but we have so much more to explore. The DVD will feature a restored version of a five reel film that Francis Ford um, made in 1918. And um, I've got newspaper trade journal evidence that John Ford was the assistant director on this film. It's called mm -hmm. The Craving. And it's a strange film that mixes special effects with mystery with uh, a World War I era consideration about the, one, the, the reckless destruction of life. Um, uh, so it's a fascinating film about rival chemists who are trying to create a secret explosive formulas. And it involves the, the villain is a, uh, an Indian chemist and it gives Francis Ford the ability, the, the occasion to reincorporate um, uh, two minutes of film from his lost early 1915 epic called The Campbells Are Coming. John Ford had a lot to do with The Campbells Are Coming, as does Grace, Grace Cunard. So when we restore this film that was actually found of, with all Dutch subtitles, it was found um, in the Eye Museum collection. And I have now, uh, with the help of some translators, turned the Dutch 
uh, 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 subtitles and intertitle cards back to English, I think people are going to find it an odd and fascinating mystery film. It's going to be the feature, and then we're going to have three other films. Uh, one is uh, the one of the only remaining short films that he appeared in with Grace, and it's at the George Eastman House. Uh, one comes from the Library of Congress in UCLA. It's the Ince film. And uh, another one comes from a private collector and the Library of Congress, and it's a marvelous uh, Western comedy shot in San Antonio. So um, I promise they're going to be there's going to be a mystery, adventure, uh, horses, guns, uh, 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 strong women, crafty men. It's going to be fun with a marvelous score by uh, my friend Ben Medell. So that's wonderful, Kathy. So thank you so much for all your work on this and just for sharing a little bit of it with us today. Thank you. Um, but hopefully again in the future. I will say that I always had the hope that someone maybe here in Maine or somewhere would re would discover those old films they made here, like Chicken Hearted Jim. Yeah. Uh, you know, these, many of these are lost films, but it'd be wonderful if people, we, we never know where they might be discovered, right? Exactly. Uh, one, one of his films, The Heart of Lincoln, was found in a barn in New Hampshire. And I, I again, for talking about another time, uh, it was Francis Ford who adored Abraham Lincoln, and he helped tutor his younger brother. They shared a tremendous uh, fascination with the Civil War and with Lincoln. And I think Francis Ford might have rate, made, wanted to make an epic about the length of Birth of a Nation that would have been all about Lincoln. And what a different film history we'd have had. Yes. Well, I can't thank you enough, Kathy. You've shared so much with us, and I look forward to our next uh, talk and wish you the best of luck with your projects. And uh, I know your students must uh, find all this fascinating in your courses and cinema studies. Um, but we will, especially on behalf of the Maine Irish Heritage Center, thank we thank, thank you for the contribution of your time uh, to our attempts to collect um, interviews with distinguished film scholars dealing with both Francis and John Ford. So until well, next time, Kathy. Thank you so much. <laughs>